are listening to WHOA Podcast, coming to you from Gainesville, Florida. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the WHOA GNV Podcast, the podcast bringing you businesses and individuals that make you go, whoa. Mike, give me your best whoa. Whoa. Becky, give me your best whoa. Whoa. (laughs) <laughs> yes, yeah. that was fire. All right. I am your host, Colin Austin, and to my left is one of the biggest UF sports fans in the entire world, Michael Dees. Michael, what is up, man? I'm not a fan. That is true. I am one of the biggest. One of the biggest. One of the yeah. biggest. Yeah. Got well, a lot of competition for that. There, there is, and and I come across it, but I think there's a there's a small subsection of people that actually have a gator tattoo, and I'm I'm among them. So <laughs> wow, so yeah. that's kind of like whoa, you know, whoa, whoa, whoa. Right. whoa. So. That's exactly right. Well, before we get too deep into this episode, you guys, I want to thank our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by our incredible sponsor, Advantage Personnel Resources. Our team at New Scooters for Less is a client of APR, and they are amazing. 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 APR is a locally owned PEO. That's a professional employer organization, y'all. And payroll provider companies that outsource to a PEO like APR grow 7 to 9% faster, have 10 to 14% lower turnover, and are 50% less likely to go out of business. All of my Gainesville business owners, get rid of your headaches <laughs> and hand them over to APR. APR's employee leasing service includes complete payroll administration, workers' compensation, HR, employee benefits, and risk management solutions. Not to mention their entire team is whoa. Whoa. <laughs> is whoa. APR is raising the bar, baby. I, Did you come up with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, came, I came up with that. I'm pretty, pr- tagline. pretty proud of that one. <laughs> uh, give APR a call at 352-495-7719 or grab more information at APRAdvantage.com. They keep telling me you can't ask too many questions and I keep trying. <laughs> They're lifesavers, seriously. Uh, I love them. Uh, that's awesome. Well, I know you're ready to get into this yeah, show. I'm so ready. This is, this, I feel like this has been a long time coming. but Yeah. I'm super I mean, stoked. we've only been asking for one <laughs> ni- 97 episodes. I mean, my gosh. <laughs> but here we are. Uh, uh, here we are, episode 97. Today on the show, we have Becky Burley, soccer coach at the University of Florida and co founder of What Drives Winning, an educational platform for sharing coaching slash thought leaders' stories on character development, self awareness, priority alignment, and and behavior management, and I must say, one of the coolest Vespa customers on the planet. (laughs) Coach, welcome to the show. Thank you. I mean, this has been a long time coming, because I was going to try and do it in the fall, just didn't happen. Yeah, you did. You did. Fall, <laughs> busy season. I, I mean, I wonder why, right? <laughs> like, can't, you can't, couldn't squeeze us in. I mean, come on. Well, so. I'm just glad to be here tonight. <clears throat> yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for coming and joining us. Um, you know, it's 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 funny because uh, before the show, you mentioned something about a little uh, that you started the the scooter <laughs> revolution. That's true. I mean, how long has New Scooters for Less been here? Mm. So, New Scooters for Less was founded in March of two thousand four. So the two thousands. We're talking about the two thousands. <laughs> <laughs> so much shade already. I love it. Just saying. So, so when did you get your Vespa? Oh, my Vespa? Or when did, did you have my, another scooter before then? Oh, I've had multiple scooters. Okay. Yes, I've had a long lineage of scooters. My first scooter I got in 1994. Okay. And started the scooter revolution at Florida. There, weren't, there wasn't even scooter parking here. I would park at bike racks. I got lots of tickets, and I actually went before the parking board. I think I'm the only sitting coach in UF history to go before the parking board. And I, I, didn't, I didn't win. You didn't win? You didn't win? No, I didn't You win. lost? I lost. The coach? They said, you shouldn't park at bike racks. And I said, well, we don't have scooter parking. I can't park in Did you play the spot. card? Do you know who I am? I, I, I'm, no, no. <laughs> Maybe that would have been a better idea. But no, and then, um, so multiple scooters down the road. I mean, I got my Vespa probably, probably in the early 2000s. I should have gotten it sooner. Mm-hmm. Everybody, Vespa is the way to go. Okay, so <laughs> you had a scooter since 
the 90s. Just the 90s. Okay. Doc Lucky, a UPD officer who oh happened my gosh, to live down the street Doc from Lucky. me. He's a <laughs> legend. He's a legend. He had a um, scooter that had been taken to the, the impounding mm-hmm. place. And he was my neighbor, and he was fixing it up, and I'm like, I'll take that scooter if you don't want it. So he gave it to me. Do you know what kind it was? It was a piece of crap. Yes. <laughs> but it was just like to try. Made brand. You know? <laughs> yeah. And then I think I got my first, uh, I think maybe Kimco was my first real foray into the scooter world. But then I kind of kept going. Okay, so you parked at a bicycle rack. I did. When did, now, when I was in school, they had the hashed parking area. It wasn't what it is today, but at the end of parking like places, you know, they had the little like hash line areas and then in the middle they had a sign that said motorcycle parking or I think it said motorcycle slash scooter parking. I don't think it said scooter because no? there were no okay. scooters. Maybe yeah, motorcycle. Right, there were no scooters. <laughs> let's like let's make sure we're very clear. There were no scooters. No scooters. None. And then this incredible dealership started called New Scooters for Less <laughs> and then all of a sudden <laughs> bam boom scooters the, all start of a sudden coming all over the, the place. scooter capital of the world. Yes. Sure. The scooter capital. That's a good tagline. That's a really good tagline. <laughs> well, <coughs> thank you for helping us create the scooter <laughs> revolution. I mean, I will give you ten percent of the credit. Uh, I'm I'm gonna barter for more than that. <laughs> <laughs> now, if everybody was riding around with sidecars, that's true. The, and, and like you're like dogs in it or something, yeah. then it'd be like, wow, that's that's all. That was a, that was a whole another iteration of the scooter. Oh, what was what was that picture? And do you remember? There was a picture um, of you and the dog. There on the was. Scooter, I, I don't and, know. Was where it in that a picture, UF magazine? Maybe. maybe. All I know is um, that sidecar came from like somewhere overseas, and it ha- it got stuck in customs in Jacksonville. <laughs> it was quite the ordeal to get the sidecar here. Okay. But it, it worked, and then I, you know, my dog loved it, but then <coughs> that dog died, and my new dog hated it. Aww. Like, absolutely hated it. Like, I would literally put food in the sidecar and try to take her over there, and she would just turn over and start peeing. Like, it just wasn't <laughs> happening. <laughs> yeah, like, it was nope. not happening. Nope, do she that. did not like it. I, I think maybe part of the reason was because the very first time she got in it with my old dog that loved it. Um, she jumped out and I ran over her paw. Just um, just paw? with the sidecar, not right, with right. my scooter. I'm sure. I mean, it, she wasn't hurt, but she hated it after that. She's traumatized. I remember when you, when that picture was in there, because I had you sign that magazine for me and then I lost it. Yeah, I don't remember what Terrible. it was in, but uh, it was a really good picture of Cody. He was so yeah. cute. He had doggles. Yeah, he had doggles. That's what I remember. <laughs> That's exactly doggles. what I remember. Uh, That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. All the memories, they, they, they come flooding back. <laughs> like, I mean, we've been doing this for 16 years now. Wow. 16 I'm years. I'm just saying, people it's who like, don't have a scooter, you just don't know the freedom that you're missing. Right? And it's just the experience. It yeah. makes going to work fun. That's awesome. Are you the only coach that scoots? Um, yeah. You're the only one that I know of. <laughs> I yeah. mean, everybody kind of looks at me sideways. <laughs> They're so, like, that's the scootering coach. <laughs> right. So let's uh, talk about that. There's an assistant coach that scooters. There's a, there's an assistant coach volleyball, Shannon Well, she scoots. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she does. And she's yep. a customer here too. Yep. Uh, shout out Shannon. <laughs> uh, but let's talk about it. So there's obviously like a safety dynamic and it's important for the sports teams. And I know that a lot of, we just had a, a couple members of the men's tennis team come in here yesterday. Coach is making us wear a helmet. So we got to come in there. Um, it, is there like a, a stigma against it? No, I mean, I just think that there's a lot of people who might think that, you know, a professional shouldn't be riding a scooter, but I'm like, why not? There's like a business professional I'm reducing in, in my carbon footprint. Right. If we lived in a city, a big city, people wouldn't blink twice. Yeah, you're right. But hey, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to reduce my carbon footprint. So amongst the coaching rings, is it like a, they would rather, they get these, I mean, some of them get huge salaries, they would rather come in with their sports car? Um, I just think they kind of just shake their head when they see me with my helmet on my scooter. And sometimes I do, sometimes maybe make creative parking spots still, maybe. I made a sign on Amazon that says, <laughs> parking for Becky's scooter. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, but so far so good. Don't have, blow it. I, I'm I'm a kind of I'm kind of afraid to ask this question, but have you ever had like one of your players get hurt on a scooter to where they couldn't um, play? Well, yeah, they've missed some they've missed some practice time. I don't know that we've ever had anybody miss a game, but 
for sure. But you like you can't control other drivers when you're scooting. Right. That's the challenge. Right. You can only try to be a defensive driver and wear the proper equipment. I just tell everybody, I'm like, like we're the most hated people. Like if a football player breaks yeah. their leg on a scooter and they can't play in the game, or you know, some athlete gets hurt, and they can't. I'm like, oh man. I'm like, oh, don't tell me that. And oh, like, we, were, we were talking about social media platforms before, and, and anytime that happens, it's like you can read it, and it's the first thing is, oh, well, scooters should be the, 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 the athlete shouldn't be on scooters anyway, and it's like, I, I don't, man, I don't think it's the scooter. I really, don't I'm, think it's I'm the with you on that. I'm with you on that. It's definitely. I mean, there are times, like I said, you can't control other drivers, but I think you you should be smart. Like, I would not take my scooter on like Archer Road. Like, I just wouldn't do that. But yeah. I take my scooter from my house to school. That's like a mile and a half, and there's no major roads, and I feel very safe. You know, it's funny, because like, we've told a lot of people about the same thing coming here. I mean, we're not far. We're like less than a half mile from UF, but it is 13th Street, and there's a lot of like a lot of traffic on that road. I'm like, well, like right behind us is a road, and it goes straight to Sorority Row, like right behind campus on off of 13th, you know? so Yeah, there's a lot of back roads you can take <laughs> to avoid traffic. Well, thanks for being such a loyal <laughs> an scooter company yeah. and an advocate for us. You're great. I mean, we've definitely had a lot of the soccer players come in here and get yeah, yeah. and get scooters and been servicing, and it's it's always it's always great to be able to uh, contribute to the success of getting athletes to practice on time. We have a, we have a thing called Real World Weekly in the spring, and there's different things that we teach in Real World Weekly, and one mm-hmm. of them last spring was scooter maintenance. <laughs> really that's so cool yeah so they know how to change do their you film any of that or anything um we've had we've done a little bit of stuff with it okay. so but, how long have you been doing that because i think i heard about that last year and it was the first time i had even heard about it and i was blown away i was like this is the most like the awesome thing that i've ever heard because i mean we talk about all the time like you know in high school you learn how to pass tests you don't learn how to do your taxes or how to do anything and then oh taxes is one of our real world weekly right so like talk 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 about it because i think it's i think it's a great program i think a lot of people maybe don't know about it so talk about it for a little bit um well we just we we surveyed our team in january we asked them list three things that you want to learn about that have nothing to do with soccer Mm -hmm. and so then we made our curriculum based on the three things that they asked for. So we have all sorts of different things. Like we have, um, last year we did changing a tire also. Um, we did an etiquette dinner. Um, we do mental wellness. We do um, all sorts of things. This year they want to do self-defense. They want to do CPR. Um, do they so, like vote on it or they just? Yeah, they just, they list the three things and then we compile it and we just take the most popular things. <laughs> so what has been your favorite one? Like that you've maybe learned the most? Hmm. I mean, the etiquette dinner. I. I mean, I thought I had good etiquette until I just I, picture. Uh, books I had no on idea. Your head and like, <laughs> which silverware? It was run by the president's office, and let me tell you, like, it was amazing. We did it at the old president's house, and um, I mean, there were just some things like I had no no idea like for example the salt and pepper are married and they always go together did you know that uh-huh. somebody asked me for salt I just give them salt All Right. I didn't know the salt and pepper were married and they always go together they asked me for salt and they're on the other end of the table I'm like tossing it I'm like, <laughs> right. here you go you would have gotten a very bad grade in the <laughs> etiquette I, dinner Yeah. I, I learned one time that you're supposed to like if there's like a loaf of bread there you're supposed to tear it and not actually cut it which is counterintuitive like I would think oh you're not supposed to like handle it is that true but there was just so many and then the, this the whole like the thing about your where your cups are and where where your silverware is. I mean, it was so informative. It was like there was a PowerPoint for this etiquette dinner. And then the practical side of it was we, we were served a very nice dinner and she would come around and like correct things that we were doing wrong. It was, it was so good. I mean, I felt more prepared to go into like a fancy dinner. So did, do you still have any of those habits that you learned or was it just like, a, oh, if I get in this environment, I know how to handle it? Um, no, I mean, I always pass the salt and pepper together now. <laughs> and like the whole napkin thing, like, you know, how you put the napkin in your lap and where you put the napkin when you get up. I thought you just put the napkin in your seat when you get up, but you do not do that. You put it on the back of your chair. Did not know that. No, I would not even think about that. No, me neither. I thought you'd just <laughs> put it in your chair so people know so that you're sitting there. So it's on my lap and I get up. You, you should put, put it on, on the back, back of, of your chair. chair. Yes. It's folded into like a triangle and you put it on the back of your chair. Wow. Who knew? I've been messing that up my entire life. <laughs> so we should have an etiquette dinner with our scooter mechanics. <laughs> I bet you will learn a lot. I'm Go just, through the president's office. They're amazing. I'm just trying to get them to wipe down their toolbox. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, like, let's, well, we got to start Love small. you guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got to start small. All right. Well, I mean, we've already like really jumped into this podcast, but like what we really like to do is, is start with your story. I mean, I, li- I like to hear... How, I mean, from your playing days to like, how, I mean, how does one become the University of Florida soccer coach? Like what, 
I mean, just tell the us. The only tell us, of Florida soccer. Yeah, like tell us your story. Oh, I hate telling this story because it's like so unrealistic to coaches today. Like this oh, will really? never happen again. Okay. But I will tell you. So I moved to Florida when I was 10. And before I moved to Florida, I lived in very rural Massachusetts. Okay. Like so rural that I have two older brothers. We all went to school in Massachusetts. But my year when it came to go to kindergarten, there were not enough kids. So they just called the parents and they were like, you can start your kid in first grade or you can wait till next year. And so my parents said, well, she's going to first grade. So I didn't even go to kindergarten. Like that's how rural we lived. So then we moved to Florida. I had never played an, uh, an organized sport, never done any sports except watch my brother play baseball. And we moved across the street from a soccer field. And my parents were like, well, you guys need to meet new kids, so go play soccer. <laughs> I didn't even know what soccer was, but it was perfect timing. It was like there was a team that was starting up. I could walk across the street and play all day. And this was at 10 years old, you said? This or? was at 10, okay. yep. And so I just started playing. I, I played in high school. My high school coach's daughter was pretty good. And so she was getting recruited by some people and um, the coaches would come to watch her play and they would talk to our coach who was her mom and she would advocate a little bit. She's like, you know, hey, that that forward wants to go too. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but like back to your daughter. And so um, (laughs) my best friend was also a forward who was pretty good. So at one point, um, the coach that came to watch us play, um, she recruit, he recruited the, the, the coach's daughter recruited my best friend and then my coach again said hey you know she wants to go too and he goes well you know like if she can get the other two to come then she can come too so all three of us went um they both left after one semester and he was stuck with me <laughs> so <laughs> that was at uh, methodist college in fayetteville north carolina and um that was really a turning point for me because my college coach got me very involved in coaching right at the beginning of my college career. Like from the very beginning, I started doing camps. I started doing ODP, which was the Olympic Development Program back then. Um, A whole bunch of stuff and started coaching. And then by the time I was a senior, uh, thought I'd be an assistant coach next and was pursuing some of those opportunities when a head coaching job opened. And it was a guy that I had worked some camps with. And he said, hey, you you can get this head coaching job. And I was like, seriously? And so he goes, no, really, you, you can. So I interviewed, got the job, graduated in May, was a head coach at Barry College in Rome, Georgia in June. So I was 21, had four players on the team that were older than me. Kind of <laughs> crazy. <laughs> it was, it was, I, I feel bad for that team, kind of. Um, but it was a really good team that I took over. We were successful, stayed there for five years, and then the Florida job opened because there was no, there was no soccer here at Florida. And so... Um, they were sort of, it was in this boom of a whole bunch of teams starting at one time. And so um, the Florida job opened. I knew I really wanted to be back in Florida. So applied for this job and got it, had a year to kind of get everything together. And then we started the next year and the rest is history. So what year did you accept the job? Uh, 94. 94, right. So yep. what was what was it like then? I mean, you said there was this boom of uh, jobs opening. Was it, was the program seen, like I think about when Amanda Lirio t- uh, took mm-hmm. the the lacrosse position, it was already an established sports program where you know you're coming in with a ton of resources and the ability to build something with a ton of support, right? Yeah, I I knew that if if Florida decided to start soccer that they were gonna be really good because first of all, like every sport here is good and I just knew that you know, they were gonna put the same resources into soccer that they had put in everything else. And there was such a supportive coaching staff. Like I feel like a lot of us were pretty young at that point and very energetic and um, all kind of were supportive of each other and had each other's backs. I mean, I can remember that first year because we didn't have a team yet. So there was no one there to host players when they came to visit. Mm -hmm. And so we would have to get people from all the other sports teams to volunteer for us to help host. And so that was, that was crazy. I mean, like the fact that all those teams sort of pitched in and helped host soccer players on their official visits to their, you know, to get the first team here. So it was just a really collaborative effort by everyone. So what was the easiest part about, and I say easy only because the proof was in the results, but what was the easiest part about selling this brand new program that you go from accepting the job in 94 to four years later being national champions? I think the easy part, honestly, was just the success that everybody else had. You you know, you just had to point to the success that all the other sports teams were having at that point and say, look, you know, we can do this too. And, 
you know, I think we had established a lot of relationships. You know, I said that I had worked ODP with my coach. That helped a lot because I knew a lot of those kids that came at that beginning point um, from ODP. So we sort of had a jump start on getting some really good kids. But then I think the turning point was um, Danielle Fotopoulos transferred mm-hmm. in here. At the time, she was like the leading scorer in the nation. She was getting married as a sophomore. Crazy. She's still married. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she... She decided to come here, which, you know, kind of changed the trajectory of things because of her just her ability to score goals. And then Abby Wambach came in as a freshman. um, So when when Danielle was a senior. And so those two are just like generational players. Mm -hmm. And we happen to have two of them at the same time. And there's definitely some luck involved in that. Mm -hmm. And there is. I'm trying to make sure I got this timeline. You would certainly know better than but Heather Mitz was right right in between. Heather Mitz was in there, too. Right. Exactly. Absolutely. So, So, I mean. That, that, I mean, that's just crazy that Heather Mitz is, is here to what, two, three years after the program starts. And then I think she grad, she and Abby didn't play together. No, they did they play did together. They did play together. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, they, were, they were on the team, I think, at least two years together. Okay. I mean, just holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it is like when you look back at it, it's definitely um, somewhat of a lining of the stars for sure. It's just, an, it's incredible. Um, and then, I mean, from an all-American standpoint later on, I mean, just even in the last, what, I guess, oh gosh, it's been eight years since Erica Temrak was here, Savannah Jordan, I mean, there, mm-hmm. it still goes on and on from an, an all-American standpoint. And and some of them have, have had taste of success with the national team too, correct? That's right. I mean, the national team sort of, you have age group national teams all the way up to the full mm-hmm. national team. And I think, I think the next person in line from this program, hopefully, is uh, Gabby Seiler who is playing professionally now and was playing really, really well and got injured, but she's just gotten cleared yesterday, so she's back to playing again for the Portland Thorns, which is one of the best organizations in the pro league, so pretty cool. That's great. Do you see any difference in, whether it's recruiting or interest or anything, like during World Cup cycles where the the average fan is maybe more interested uh, in what they're seeing on TV? Yeah, for sure. I think um, whether it's the World Cup or the Olympics, because the Olympics are Mm -hmm. August, um, I think it just brings attention to the team that's so, so successful. I mean, our women's national team has been amazing. And the fact that those women have bigger platforms than just soccer too also brings it to a whole new level. Um, And I think it's kind of cool because I think the casual fan becomes a soccer fan during that time. And we can just hope to capture that interest here at UF and continue it. It's, it's always fun for me because I've, I've been a, I think I first got into international soccer uh, in 2002 when the men were making a run, I believe it was the co-host at South Korea, Japan. Um, but ever since then, it's like, okay, how, how does how does U.S. soccer become a, a, a legitimate contender, right? And the the women's team, obviously, the Mia Hamm, Brandy Chastain, I mean, they were they were doing phenomenal, right? But you, we could never get the success uh, on the men's side, or at least it was just never really like they were never they were never going to take it, right? Mm-hmm. But now it's like almost the teams are piggybacking off of each other where it's like you can almost sustain and this is just my own personal day but it's like it's like there's you're starting to sustain interest because the men's team will will do okay and they'll, they'll make a run like they did uh, they obviously missed the cycle last time but they'll make a run and then the the next year the women's team wins the thing and, right. and it's sustaining that interest and so it's like how do you I guess I, I'm actually getting to a question here how do you how does both programs work together uh, the, the national teams the collegiate teams to grow um, soccer in America well speaking of the two national teams I don't know if you saw today but it was really cool that the, the men's national team kind of came out in a really really big supporting way with the women's team in terms of the whole equal pay thing mm-hmm. um, and I didn't it, see this it's amazing it's not just a short statement it's a huge kind of manifesto about supporting the national teams equally uh, but I think that you know here's the thing with collegiate soccer on the women's side um, collegiate soccer is part of the platform of development of getting to the national team and the success that we've had on the men's team it's played a smaller role and I think part of that is because when you think about it you know internationally 
a lot of men are pros by the time they're, you know, 14, 15 mm-hmm. years old. They're already signed pros with clubs. Over here, you know, it's not quite that way. And I think that has made college soccer have to work hard for relevance on the men's side. Whereas on the women's side, we've already had that a little bit. So I think there's big, big differences in the way that both are going to be successful. But just the fact that, you know, like I said today, being really encouraged by the the cohesiveness between the two programs, I think that's going to that's gonna really push us over the top. And I think it's going to help the men too. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the, the men's team that missing the cycle this last time, that was really tough. That was really right. tough. But I just feel like, you know, it's it's a whole like people compare the women and the men all the time. And I think that's a very unfair comparison because it's a whole different landscape. And, you know, the goal for us is to make sure that we're getting the right people at a very young age into (coughs) soccer. And that's tough. You know, it seems like soccer is becoming a very high price sport and we have to change that to get as many people as we want and, you know, at every level into the sport. Because the truth is there's not a shortage of athletes in America. No, it's just what sure. sport they're picking to play. Right. And on the men's side, they're the, the, the lucrativeness of basketball contracts and football contracts and baseball contracts, if there's not a domestic league that's strong enough or there's not notoriety that's strong enough, it's like, okay, well, which one would you pick? Is, is it the same for the women's game? Or well, can- I think the women's, the, what makes the women's side really different is like culturally the U.S. was so far ahead of so many countries in terms of women playing sports and it being acceptable, you know, for a very long time. Like, I mean, we're talking like in the 90s and 2000s, in Brazil, they picked teams to join like these national tournaments based on the looks of the players. They they played in tournaments where like makeup was a requirement. Jeez. Like it's just crazy things. Like they were so yeah. sexist. And and this is like we're talking recent history, right. you know. Whereas in in America, like that would just be considered insane. You know, like we're not gonna support that but here you know the fact that we got that jump on people was great but we have to make sure that we keep up and I think that's where the women's game is right now is like how are we going to continue to evolve so that we don't fall behind because now like the women's league in England is putting a ton of money into their sports you know all these others you know the French league all these different leagues are seeing the value of marketing women in sports well once it becomes a money issue you know now all of a sudden like we have to make sure that we keep up with that that. Right. That's awesome. I'm sure you've got tons of not. <laughs> I was just uh, yeah. gonna stay over here and let you guys there. podcast because <laughs> any, like, anytime we get sports or food on there, it's just yeah, like sports okay. Are good. <laughs> sports are. I mean, sports are way better than food. I mean, at least, at least we're talking about like things that uh, they don't. Uh, I mean, my questions aren't nearly as great as that. I just I just want to know what it's like when Abby scores a goal in the World Cup in the 90th minute to like win it. That was crazy. Like, what like Jeez. how do you feel? Uh, I mean, as the you know as a coach you're like I can still feel the rug I mean, on is my it all, legs. Yeah, like that, sliding the I think I was in Europe when that happened and um, it was pretty amazing but I, I just think that like that World Cup was really cool because I felt like for the first time um, the team was recognized for what they were doing on the field and not necessarily like the stereotypical like oh these cute girls are marketing pert you know or something some product it was more about like wow like they just were so competitive and they just got it done and even like Kate casual male fans were impressed by their performance and I think that was a game changer yeah I mean I I just remember and, and so and more than one world cup where I mean, we were like closing the dealership and go. I mean, I was like, I'm like losing, I'm like losing myself over these games. (laughs) Well, you (laughs) You know, know, like like, when you watch, when you saw Abby like head that ball in, like there's just so many men's players who would find that difficult, you know? And then I remember one of the World Cup qualifiers. I literally, like, I literally. <laughs> literally, I said literally a lot, and apparently, apparently, it got called out. Just we're, we're gonna have to put like um, a money jar there. I, I like lost my. And I, you know, like I like lost it when that but happened. But it was an amazing I was going goal crazy. on any going level. Going crazy. Yeah. And then uh, I was going to say like the, the qualifiers leading up to that. I can't remember if it was that. I think it was the World Cup before that. Or maybe it was right before the Olympics where Abby goes up to head a ball with another player and um, they collide. 
she splits her forehead open <laughs> there's very little time left on the clock and it's a qualifier like it's a everything's on the line and she goes off gets her head like literally stapled with a staple gun and goes back on and played <laughs> which by the way now we know is a stupid idea but <laughs> um, but like just the fact that like I mean who staples their head like male or she female does. like that is just a ridiculous thing thing to eat like you can see her on the sidelines with somebody stapling her head i mean that's crazy so that makes me think of a question and i i try to (laughs) walk back from it being so men men versus women thing but (laughs) for the longest time the men's game the the national team they lacked one of the biggest things they lacked was any kind of finisher around the net meanwhile on the women's side you've got an all-time maybe maybe all-time great right Mm mm-hmm I always looked at it and was like, I think she could play on that team and make a huge difference, the men's team. Mm -hmm. Is that asinine? Because I was told all the time, no, she would lose a physical match with another guy. And I'm like, I I don't think so. I've never been in that situation where I could say what kind of strength it takes. So I ask you, is that asinine? I think that... Abby, you know, she she's the youngest of seven and like she there were a lot of boys in that lineup and I think that you know, she she could hold her own, her own physically with a lot of men. Now, like when you're starting to talk about the national team and you're getting to the very very highest levels of athleticism mm-hmm. and power and all those things, I mean, yeah, I mean, the timing to head a ball is more important than probably anything else. And timing is just something that sort of, you know, you learn over time, but it's also, there's a little bit of innateness to it. And Abby had that in spades. And I think that's a hard thing to, like, there's a lot of men who don't have that. I mean, we like you said, we, mm-hmm. we have lacked a major finisher. There's something to that skill that you just can't teach. You know, Danielle Fotopoulos had that. Savannah Jordan had that. Like this, when you see it, you know what it is. And as coaches, we wish we could teach it because if we could, you know, we'd have lots of finishers. But that's a that's a skill that's some kind of innate. Yeah, I just know I saw so many inch perfect crosses delivered, and I was like, if we could just put Abby on the end of one of those, <laughs> we would be so much better. And it, you know, people told me I was crazy. I don't know if it is or not, but. I, I, I would, I'd like to it. watch it. I'm, yeah. uh, I'd, be, I'd be a fan from, of that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I wouldn't bet against her, that's for no, sure. No, me neither. Me neither. Do you like to, to celebrate? Like, I mean, this past season, you were recognized 500 wins, right? Mm. That, like, yeah. I think I mean, it's did weird. Did you go out and like party? No, or no, you just no, like, no, oh, like no. What, whatever? I mean, <laughs> I mean, here's the thing about the whole 500 thing or any number like that. Like, it's. It's like you, it's such a collective effort of like staff, players, everybody all together. But like then it gets kind of lumped on the head coach, which I get it. Like, you know, you're the leader, blah, blah, blah. But it just seems to me like maybe that's something you recognize after you're done. But when you're in it, like you're just thinking about, okay, like where's 501 coming from? You know, like you just don't really get a chance to sit there and reflect on like this this number is this a big number you know it's i don't know it's i've always thought it was kind of a weird thing but yeah it happens yeah i mean are you and the reason i'm asking this question is because i'm very so so i don't ever take time to celebrate Mm -hmm. i'm always like on to the next mission the next goal the next like I, i i recall that that year what was the, the goal was like how many scooters for august or something yeah it was uh i think we were trying to hit 50 or yeah, something it was like right around 250 like and we hit it like with uh, like a week left yeah or there was still we hadn't even got to back to school like weekend yet and, and somehow we like i'm yeah. like god oh, the new numbers 291 i don't know where 291 yeah, came like from. no we're, we're gonna hit 300 we're gonna hit 350 <laughs> yeah, we're gonna sell a thousand this year i just kept i just kept like hitting the, like let's go let's go let's go i mean it didn't take any everybody's like well can we just celebrate the fact that we just hit this right. goal like and we hit we had it never we hit sold it with, that many before we had never ever. sold that many in a month and and we just hit this goal and i'm like no like 300 and we ended up hitting but see, i think like team goals like i'm i'm all for celebrating team goals and okay. i think you should because like if you don't they just pass by and you don't ever get an opportunity to to you know really recognize what has happened i think the problem i have is like things like you know um the 500 wins or like hall of fame thing stuff like that like mm-hmm. i just even even on our team like when we have all sec or like one of the most ridiculous things i've ever heard of is like preseason all sec like what <laughs> right, what is that right. even you know like <laughs> so stuff like that to me is just <laughs> 
I don't know. I, I guess people like to talk about it and get into it and debate things. You know, is LeBron better than Michael Jordan? Like all this kind of stuff. It's just to me, that's not. I don't know. I just don't really get into any of that. The individual award thing is when you're playing a team sport. Maybe mm-hmm. it works when you're, you know, a golfer or a tennis player or something like that, but not So for is me. LeBron better than Michael Jordan? <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> so is there like do you think that you'll not that you don't appreciate it, but do you think that like you're you're removed from coaching, you're retired, you're looking back, do you think that it'll feel different then where you can look back and maybe I don't think I'm gonna look back at numbers. I really don't. I, I mean, I'll tell you a very poignant story that happened to me early in my career at Florida. So um, Andy Brandy, who was the tennis coach here, um, was retiring, uh, leaving Florida to go, I think he was going to coach pro at the time. And he had been very, very successful. And we had like this little uh, reception for him as he was leaving. And there were a lot of people who came back and, you know, they talked a lot about his success on the court and all the accolades that he had won and things like that. And probably about, I don't know, it was very soon after that, um, that Donnie Crane, who was the diving coach here, was killed in a boating accident. Mm -hmm. And they had like a reception for his family um, very soon after that. And people came and they told all these stories about Donnie and and Donnie was also a very successful diving coach, but nobody, I mean, I realized two different situations, so I'm not trying to minimize either one of those, but like nobody in Donnie's thing talked about anything about numbers, anything about his success. And he was very successful. They just kind of told stories about Donnie and talked about Donnie as a person. And to me, like, it was really poignant for me at that moment to be like, you know, like, I, I want to, I want people to remember me like Donnie, not like just the numbers. And, and I'm, there were people who talked, um, very nice stories about Andy as well, but it was more focused on his achievements. Whereas Donnie was more focused on who he was as a person. And mm-hmm. I think that was a huge, um, aha moment for me. Just taking that in because I mean, I think it's, I think it's spot on and, and there's, I mean, I think there's a time to celebrate the personal achievements. Um, but it, it, call, it all comes back, especially like you said, in a team sport where it's like, I, I don't know, it, it definitely puts a different perspective on things. Uh, yeah, it's just there's so many people involved in winning. Like it's not, right. it's not one person. Like I can kind of understand, like I said, if I'm, you know, Serena Williams and I've won X number of singles matches, like I did that. Now I have a coach and I have a trainer and I have all these other staff around me, but like I was on the court and I won those. In soccer, you know, there's 11 people on the field just at one time, let right. alone like how many people get on the field. And then there's other coaches and it's just so different. And I just, I can't never individualize that. So are you a big birthday person? No, I, you know, I'm adopted. So I really like to celebrate my, um, my adoption day, okay. but I, my birthday is on a Friday the 13th. I was born on Friday the 13th. So I, that's a good luck day for me. Everything, the opposite, like whenever anything is bad luck for anyone else, it's good luck for me. Yeah. So, <laughs> Allison's here today. It just makes me think of that. Like she always rides me about my birthday. I'm not a birthday person. I couldn't. Care. My birthday falls during the season, so it's like, what are you going to do? Yeah, what are you going to do? You right? know, it's like, like I win. That's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> you get out there. When and you win, <laughs> win it for coach. You don't want to send her out a loser. Uh, no, I'm just not a big birthday. But to me, it's like it's not an accomplishment. It's not anything I did. Like if you want to celebrate me, like say thank you to my parents for bringing me into this world. But my birthday has nothing. You yeah, see, to that's do with that's me. how I feel too. Because adoption day, like my parents, like literally chose. Like they went to the store and said, "We'll take her." Like you know, it's like that's a that's a that's an action. You mm-hmm. know. I, my parents always told me I was chosen, you know, and all these other people who were just born, like they got stuck with whatever they got, but I was chosen. But you were chosen. I like that. Yeah. So I was the chosen one before LeBron. It's a scooter revolution <laughs> revolution, and then the chosen one before LeBron. I mean, those two things are, are really significant. We, are, we have a legend here. You know that. <laughs> a living <laughs> a li- legend. <laughs> So I mean, do you, I've got, yeah, I've I, got, got I was gonna say I've got tons I can go into. I, pretty, okay. I mean, so I mean, you know, from going playing in college to becoming a coach and become, you know becoming the head coach of the University of Florida, like the where did you really get your leadership lessons? Like, was that mm, just from your co- like from your coaches? I mean, or are you in are you doing other things to continuously invest into your leadership? Because that's obviously been a huge factor here. Um, Going deep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that, <laughs> this is what I do. You know, and it's funny because a lot of people quite, like always just ask me about the podcast, right? Because people are like, man, like, so your business podcast. I'm like, well, like, I mean, this is a podcast and it teams, it seems, 
typically leans towards uh, an entrepreneurial audience. Um, but that's, that's because parallels. that's because I'm an entrepreneur and that's what I love. But you know, when we bring in athletes, when we bring coaches, when we bring in authors, when we bring in, you know, children, when we bring in police officers, whatever it is, like there's always these leadership lessons that absolutely get tied into whatever you do. No whether, doubt. Whether it's like as a human being or in your job or, you know, running a business or as an athlete, like whatever, like lead, leadership is a, a common thing that we all need. Well, here here's something super crazy when you think about it. Like, do you know what qualification you have to be to be a coach? Do I know? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> like, n- not even you've had to play the sport. Like, most cases you have, but like, really nothing and how insane is that that like we trust our children with people who have no training and no qualifications <laughs> just saying um so i think it's really incumbent upon the coach to decide how they're going to invest in themselves and how they're going to continue to grow and how they're going to be professionally developed because no one is making you do it like it's not like soccer we are probably the most advanced because we actually have to go to coaching school in order to advance and get a license and it's it's pretty rigorous i mean you go to coaching school at least four times so that's like you know once every year you go and that's that's the minimum that you can go is four times and it's like written evaluations oral evaluations on the field coaching and it's it's pretty in depth but still like that's all pretty much X's and O's. And then, you know, the first day you walk into being a head coach and some crisis arises and you're like, they did not teach me this in coaching school. <laughs> you know, we cannot solve this with like a 442. So it's all of that stuff, like the human related issues are something that you either learn by experience, you learn by leaning on other people and asking them for help, which that's been a big um, thing for me is I've been really fortunate, especially early in my career to be surrounded by a lot of people that are willing to help and I am completely willing to ask. I think that's something that a lot of coaches don't like to ask because they feel like, well, maybe I'll look stupid or that I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, I'm asking because I'm gonna look really stupid when I do something worse than what I should do. So um, I've been really fortunate to do a number of things. Like uh, one of the first things I did um, early in, well, that's not really, I feel like kind of embarrassed because it wasn't early enough in my career, but I went to the Women's Coaches Academy um, that the NCAA puts on. And that was kind of the first time I really thought about like not so much professional development because I think I had been doing that all along with my soccer association, but like actually giving back to professional development. Um, and then just with what drives winning, you know, that's something that Brett Ledbetter and I founded, I guess now about seven years ago. And that's just listening to a whole bunch of different coaches talk about what they do. It's like, we're not providing answers. We're just kind of providing what other people who have been really successful do. And then it's sort of up to you to sort of pick and choose what works for you. And then all sorts of different things. Like I've tried to, you know, ask coaches, like I'll read something. I, I, a really good example I've always used is, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, there was an article about Jack Clark. He's the rugby coach at Cal Berkeley. I don't know Jack Clark at all. Just thought the article was really good. So I looked up the Cal Berkeley Athletic Directory and called Jack Clark. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm the soccer coach at Florida. I know you don't know me, but I was really interested in that article. And then he talked to me. We met for a spring break the next year. He introduced me to a bunch of coaches at Cal Berkeley. And it's just like, <laughs> there's hardly anybody that says no if you ask. But I feel like most people just won't ask. Right. And I don't know why. I mean, I guess it's the fear of rejection. Yes, I've, I've, that, I, that's huge. But I've asked like people who have, well, they really haven't said no. They just don't call me back or, you know, don't email me back. But like, okay, what's what's the worst that could happen? If the worst that could happen is that they're not going to respond, then I'm probably going to, you know. I'm, they could I'm, say no 97 times. <laughs> yeah, that's true. 96 times. That's true. <laughs> and then, <laughs> now, I will tell and you. end up on your like, podcast for episode 97. <laughs> that brings up another leadership lesson, you guys. Persistence. Keep asking. Hey, I'm with you on that. and drive like Totally June with you on that. <laughs> I mean, if somebody says no to me, then I just, I will just, 
I will ask him in a different way. You know, like I'll tell you the really good example, Brian Shelton, you were just talking about him earlier because those guys came in to get helmets. Go Brian Shelton. Yeah. Um, I think he is one of the best human beings on the planet and I really respect him. And yet our seasons are opposite. So it's often like I'm busy in the fall and he's busy in the spring and it's hard for us to connect. And every time I see him, I'm like, I'm going to stalk you. We're going to go out for coffee. We're going to do this, you know, and, and we actually have been able to get together a couple times. Um, but you know, it's like finding the people who you really respect and investing in them and, you know, making it a relationship, not just like, you know, saying you want to, but like literally doing it and asking people to help you. And, to me, that's been my biggest professional development has been the people around me. I can walk down the hall and talk to Mouse Holloway or Mary Wise. Um, it's it's amazing. I mean, look at the the brain power in this just the athletic association, and then you know think about it at UF. I mean, God, there's so many resources at UF that I feel like we don't even get a chance to explore because maybe we don't even know the connection yet. But you just you just never know who you're going to be sitting next to on that little plane out of Gainesville. You know, like there's there's tons of opportunity to to meet people and to be curious about it. It's just a matter of whether you're willing to do it. So I'm listening to that and you you brought up uh, Coach Holloway, you brought up Coach Wise. And I'm thinking about just the sheer amount of I mean, Florida's Florida's just been blessed with with coaches, um, I mean, Mary Wise, Roland Thornfisk, Greg Troy, Billy Donovan, Kevin Ozzie, I mean, they've all been here for a decade or longer. I know, it's crazy. And that's not normal. No, definitely and not. It, it doesn't matter what sport it is, that's not normal. What What is the keys to the continuity across the board in our athletic department? And then separately, what's been the key for you to be here for how long I won't say that. Yeah, how we long you've been we just here? Yeah, bleep out that number. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I, I tried to stop before I got there, but I could. I was gonna make like a really loud noise. But... <laughs> um, well, I think I think initially, you know, when Jeremy Foley was our athletic director, he he really invested in his people, and I think that sort of set the tone for everyone in terms of. Um, you knew you were going to be treated well. You knew you were going to have the resources you needed to have to win, and that that was really apparent like from the very beginning I think even even from like day one when I came here um, and then I think Scott Strickland has continued that you see the investment he's making in people and facilities here on campus like that that's been like kind of a whole new era with that too but you know why would you leave Florida like you have an amazing school academically you have an amazing school athletically. You have great weather, especially for the outdoor sports where you can train almost year round. Um, you know, everything about, it, I mean, Gainesville is, an, is such a fun town to live in. Um, there's just so much going on for a town this size. And I think that, that why would you leave? You know, I feel like I sort of hit the lottery like at age 26 getting like a dream job like that's why again like my story just doesn't happen like I can't see Florida hiring like a 26 year old who had only been in an NAI school before it was just a different era at that time but for me to get there at that age like that's a pinnacle job why would I want to leave it's just yeah it's it's crazy I mean you, I even think of um uh, Rhonda Fain, who was here for over a decade, took on That's women's right. national team. Uh, Greg <clears throat> Troy has taken on national team responsibilities. And, and Mouse is the national and, team and, coach. And, this, and Coach Holloway. Yeah. And, and it's just it's just wild. And then I think about the the SIDs and the the Chip Howards and the Mike Hills that were here for. So there's just been so much continuity, mm -hmm. and it's just an, incredible. Um, yeah, and they think the key to that though is like because the other side of of continuity is making sure that you continue to evolve. Because I think there can get some stale if you're not careful with being yes. at one place for a long time. So I think there is always that push to continue to improve yourself and not rely on, oh, we've always done it that way. You know, it would be like saying I would coach players right now in the same way that I would coach players in 1994. You know, like people ask all the time, like, are kids different? Well, of course kids are different because like the environment is different. Parenting is different. Like everything is different and if I don't recognize that and find a way to meet them where they are then you know I'm just going to be like this old school coach who can't connect you don't you have know? to have a social media policy with Heather uh, Heather Mitz <laughs> and Abby right. Wambach right I think it's a really good thing there was no social media back then <laughs> <laughs> that's all I'm going to say <laughs> a really good thing uh, that's crazy I mean 
So uh, that's super interesting to me. I mean, the the changes, whether it's with technology and how that's that's impacted, you know, your you know how you coach for uh, sure. I mean, like, like social media, like just social media. That's like a whole animal to contend with you know just the like, like just that you do you have you have a you have a policy you have, like, uh no i mean i think what we need to be teaching our players is how to um leverage social media and how to use social media for their benefit as opposed to how to use social media to or not even how to use it but how to look at social media as a i'm going to be up and down like a thermostat based on what people are saying about me and i think that's the negative part of social media it's like you remember a couple years ago we were playing um florida state and men's basketball and um it was at home last second shot fsu was shooting and our guy tipped it in yes. do you remember that i remember who it was Okay, so I great guy. Yeah, I mean that's what I'm saying. That kid was just like it was an effort play. He was trying to get the rebound, and then he tips it in, and Mm -hmm. and FSU wins. And you know, you read social media after that, and it's just like, what what are you people thinking? Like it was so bad. Sometimes it's the worst of humanity. Yeah. Yeah, and so to me, it's like, how do you teach anyone, not just our players, but how do you teach anyone to? follow the people who are going to make you feel better about yourself and disregard the people who are going to make you feel worse about yourself. But like, that's a real thing. If I, you know, my senior year, we were playing in the game to go to the final four goes to penalties and we lose in penalties. I hit mine high and wide. I mean, it was, it was a really good shot if you're into the atmosphere, (laughs) (laughs) but but like, you know, nobody knew that except for the, you know, a couple hundred people who were at the game and my teammates, you know, but if that's today, like that's on social media and it's like replayed over and over again it's probably like a meme of it going into outer space or something you know like <laughs> right, and right. so I didn't have to deal with that over and over and over again like it happened it was done with and you know clearly I was like devastated because my college career was over but it wasn't like an ongoing thing beyond that right you don't have to answer all the questions about how you buckled under pressure exactly. in a big moment or anything exactly so are you trying Not to, that co- you did. to coach on saying. that like, I mean like are you trying like yeah do, social do media is going to be one of our real world about weeklies that. Oh, yeah. it is. Okay. and we did it last year a little bit too it's it's kind of like so this is how I use social media. This is not what I'm suggesting for our players. But like for me, I look at social media as a platform for me to learn. So I follow a lot of people. I think I follow like, I don't even know, like 1,800 people or something. But they're all like um, coaches, thought leaders, um, positive right. things. Podcasters? Podcasters. Do you, do you follow me? <laughs> I do. Oh, okay. Awesome. <laughs> <And> I, <laughs> Just making sure. <laughs> but like stuff that's going to enhance me you know like I look at it as like it's like TV for me like I can watch The Bachelor or I can watch something that's educational you know and and it's not to say that there's not room for things on social media like The Bachelor but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna follow something that's negative or that's you know promoting something that I don't want to promote and I'm certainly not going to like engage in dialogue about like retweeting things that I'm against because all I'm doing is then amplifying that voice, you know? And so that's to me the part that I don't think that we have done a very good job of teaching overall is how to use social media to actually help you and to promote the things that you want to promote. And I don't know, to me, it seems very simple, but you know, I guess the whole fear of missing out and all that kind of stuff makes you want to hear those bad things. I don't want to hear those bad things. You know, there's like some soccer blog out there that I guess people just like rake everybody over the coals. I don't even know what that is because I'm not going to sit and listen to that. I mean, I remember Jeremy Foley said something really early to us. He's like, you know, if you if you listen to that, you take, you know, an hour a day and listen. That's an hour a day that you're not getting better. And I'm like, that's exactly right. So why would I do that? But yet players do it all the time you know and it's it's crazy it's i think we've got to do a better job of educating there yeah 
do you get any fuel from haters or anything like that? I don't really, I don't think I listen to haters. So I'm not sure if like, I mean, if, if somebody is saying something negative, I'm pretty much blocking you, you know? And if it's, if it's negative about our team, if it's negative about me, like I just, I don't, I don't want to know. I'm not like one of those people, like I need to know so I can formulate my defense. Like you don't even matter to me because I don't even know who you are. Now, if it's somebody close to me that's kind of giving me some harsh feedback that I need to hear, I want that. You know, and I think that's the difference. Like, well, that's does, because they know you. Yeah, but and do, they, and know, like, like, and do they, they care about me? That's right. Too. They they know me. They care about me, and they don't have a you know a competing interest, and they're competent. Like, if the, if they meet those, if they meet those criteria, I'm listening to that all day. But if it's some random person who I don't even know, I don't, I have no interest in that opinion. I've got some critical feedback for you. I'm ready. <laughs> um. <laughs> I have some critical feedback for you too. Oh gosh. <laughs> Um, it's, it's probably time to trade in your scooter and get a new one. Well, that's really funny because I was just going to say, I'm still waiting on some parts for my scooter. <laughs> oh, she said she has feedback for you. It's really that for was me. For him. <laughs> the feedback was for him. I've got a blinker literally oh, right there see, on my desk. There it is. There Why is it, it is. on your desk and not on her scooter? <laughs> because I literally just got it within the last like. 10 days. But I'm going to say that's for the black Vespa. What <laughs> about Pearl? Pearl? Oh, no, that one's for Pearl. That oh, that's for Pearl. Pearl? That one's oh, for Pearl okay, because good. right now, if I if I remember, gosh, How I'm many Vespas have... do you have? Two. Oh, it's time to have three. <laughs> Let's go. What I do. We... I You know, I was looking at that poster of that red one back there and I was really a little. That one's cool. That would be a great one. I got a classic I'll sell you. Okay. A classic. What's the red one got? You know, but is it a 150? Miles? Oh, I, I, I got to have a, a 1971 though. Yeah, yeah, 125. 125 okay, 125. Yeah. I can but do it's that. It's got the old school shifter and everything. Oh, uh, yeah, it's neat. Yeah. Uh, sorry, <laughs> that was my critical feedback. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> I, I was hoping we were going to get at that off off record, but like, you know, that's fine. I'll take it. It's fine. Um, I still have one of your helmets. There's I need nothing to turn off in. record. It all no. gets blast, blasted. No. One can on, hope, though. Blasted right? on social media. James will cut it into a micro piece of content that we then blast that on social media. And everybody knows that the blinker for my paper, Pearl my paper way to is it. on your desk right. and not on Becky's scooter. All right. It does have an amber lens, so you can actually. See I, I do see yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Pearl needs it. Like she, she, <laughs> she needs a new blinker and a little bit of a, a little cleanup because the pollen has made her less pearl. Oh I will, God. I will throw in <laughs> the complimentary <laughs> detail for you. The pollen is serious yeah, right now. So. Um, when all this is said and done, years and years and years from now. Oh, okay. Can I interrupt you? Yeah. I can I. Can I say the S word on here? You can say whatever okay. you want. You're, so um, you're the coach. This is new. This is relatively new since January. I think we're gonna. I'm gonna go around and I'm gonna interview a lot of people and we're gonna write a book and it's gonna called. It's gonna be a soccer book called hashtag Can't Make That Shit Up <laughs> because there's a lot of stories in soccer that would just blow your mind and you can't make them up. You just can't make them up. And that's what I'm going to do when it's all said and done. That's funny. You know, now that you said that, I've always wanted to write a book that was that it was a customer service book. And it's what you said. Things I but, really wanted to but say. But what you really wanted to say. <laughs> that would be good, too. Right. That would be really good. I, You know, I've had a little experience in customer service. I was a Publix Bakery girl for five years. Okay. And I worked at Burger Queen. Not a chain. There was only one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, customer service whoo it's where that's it's awesome. at so i i know we probably are gonna have to wrap up soon i do yeah. have one more topic i wanted to at least get your thoughts on it's a little eh, loaded but like we talked about evolution as a coach evolution as a player and one of the hot button topics that it's not going away anytime soon is the idea of amateurism mm -hmm. and whether athletes should be paid deserve to be played whether they're being exploited um I'm not asking to get super political, but just what are your thoughts on that? Is, have we gotten to a point where we can't, you know, keep turning a blind eye to it? Do we need to do something about it? You know, I think what's going to be very interesting about that topic, because obviously the whole name in, image and likeness thing is a big thing in our world right now. Um, it's the same, like if you read the stuff that's going on with the women's national team, there's a lot of similarities there mm -hmm. about the exploitation of players for the national team's sake, with the national team sitting on these millions of dollars in their federation. I, I think the thing that we gotta think about is it, it potentially could change the entire landscape of sports. Meaning, will sports like women's soccer go away completely because 
if we're if we're looking at paying people, how do you separate who gets paid, who doesn't? Because our athletes spend 20 hours a week on their sport, just as football athletes spend 20 hours, as basketball athletes spend 20 hours, as tennis players spend 20 hours. And that is like literally a full-time job. If you're an athlete at this level, the 20 hours is only like hours that we're counting. That doesn't count like, you know, if you're putting your body in the cold tank or you're you know, sitting in the training room getting treatment, you know, we're not even counting those hours. So it's like, it is definitely eliminating other things that you cannot do if you're an athlete at this level. And so in looking at that, like, and you're gonna pay people, are you only gonna pay the people who are bringing in revenue? That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. You know, are you gonna pay everyone? That could, you know, financially break athletic departments and, Florida has been always, I think, very fiscally responsible. We don't have a lot of sports, but I was at Penn State just the day before yesterday. They have 31 sports. Like, you know, that's way different than us. And so now how do you slice that pie? So I just think it's gonna be really interesting to see where this whole thing takes us and does it take us into a whole different level or does, you know, power five sports break off and do their own thing and now all of a sudden we have like, kind of a super conference that's doing things that the rest of division one isn't doing. Mm-hmm. I, I think my perspective is really different because um, I'm the only Florida coach that didn't play division one. I. I think mouse went to junior college, um, but the rest of us, everybody else there played division one coach division one. I, I played division three, which is a real different model. And there's no, you know, um, there's no real intersection there in terms of like w- what the purpose is of you're going to school at division three, you're an athlete second to being a student. And I think at Florida, if you talk to most of the athletes, a major, major factor, if not the factor is their sport, why they picked Florida. And so I don't know. I think things are going to I think things are going to change a lot in the next few years. Maybe maybe as soon as this year. You know, there's a lot of lobbying of Congress and things that are going to be happening that are going to make things very different. But where I've always had a little bit of an internal conflict is when coaches don't really follow the same type rules as players. You know, coaches can leave at any time. You mm-hmm. can leave in the middle of a contract. You can you can leave after you've told a class that you're staying. You can kind of do whatever you want. Um, and that has been, I think, the crux of the argument for a lot of people is why do athletes fall under all these restrictions when coaches have all this freedom? I think that's an interesting argument. Hmm. Yeah. If you were president of the NCA, do you have a solution that you would... Gosh. First of all, I would never want to be president of the NCAA. <laughs> Got an enviable job. Oh, no. that Oh, boy. I would. Come I'd, on. Add that to the resume. <laughs> Let's go. Um, I don't. I don't know the answer to that question. I think there's just so many moving pieces to that question. I mean, you know, it, we look at it like we think of recruiting. You know, recruiting for us has been a big hot button item that's, you know, there's been a lot of recruiting reform lately where it's backed it up now. We can't talk to anybody besides juniors and seniors. <clears throat> and, you know, in soccer, we were one of the worst. Like, ninth graders, eighth graders were committing. Like, that's crazy. You know, when I talk to a ninth grader and then I talk to an 11th or 12th grader, it's like talking to two completely different people. Yeah. Like, completely different. And, you know, just to even get sort of an agreement on recruiting, which is such a tiny slice of what we're talking about, took probably 15 years for us to get any kind of recruiting reform done. So this is a way bigger problem. So how long that's gonna take, I don't know. I don't know if I'll still be recruiting. I mean, I'll be coaching by the time that that gets solved. It's definitely something that's not going away anytime. No, soon. it's not. And well, it, do you have thoughts on it? Because I mean, you're a big sports guy. Like when all that know, stuff started coming out, and everybody was talking about it, like it's tough because I, I'm certainly not the most educated. There's so many unintended consequences, intended consequences, and and I'm somebody that I I love the collegiate game because I think it's sport in its most pure form. Um, you start pumping money into it, and. It, that becomes what people play for, and that's what I fear. I like the purity of the game. I like the playing for the team and not playing for, you know, the dollar. Um, I, give me college football. Give me NFL. I'm not saying they don't care if they lose. It just doesn't quite matter as much. Um, 
if you look at people like uh, Tim Tebow, who didn't get paid and has made a huge career off of the notoriety, the celebrity that he gained by being who he was, but not because he was afforded opportunities that he didn't help create himself. So I think that there's a path that people can, especially in a, we talk about influencer, social media marketing, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Like you don't need that, but where it really starts to get defendable is 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 on the if you're not a Tim Tebow if you're uh you know playing a if you're nothing against him a cross country athlete a golfer where the mm-hmm. revenue's not coming in <clears throat> what are you entitled to you want them to be equal but do you end up just is it a profit share model is it is it the NCAA says that you get the athlete gets this amount of money as a stipend Regardless, I mean, I don't, I don't know. There's, just like you said too. There's, there's places like Penn State. There's places like Stanford that have an obscene amount of intercollegiate uh, programs. I, I wish Florida had more, but maybe that's not the answer because if it starts to, if, there used to be a statistic, and I don't remember it exactly. And maybe it would be like Florida's one of the only athletic departments that operate in the in the black and actually donate that money back to the university athletic association. I'm sorry, the Alum- alumni association. Um, a lot of times it goes the other way. Mm-hmm. And and so that's a that's a good thing. But if you start having these programs working cash poor or the, the money's not getting there or it's getting to some athletes and not other athletes, uh, there's just so much red Well, and tape. I think part of the way that they're trying to address that is the name, image, and likeness because not every person's name, image, and likeness is gonna be in demand. Mm-hmm. But the question then becomes, who's gonna help manage that whole name, image, and likeness while that person is in school. If it's gonna be the university, then, so we're gonna create a department of name, image, and likeness management. And then the question is, if the university isn't gonna control that, then, you know, that that opens a whole nother can of worms that if it's unregulated, that you can just kind of capitalize on your name, image, and likeness in any way. Yeah, are you, you know? are you a contracted employee at that point? Do you, do you, are you hiring an agent as an amateur to broker these things for you, negotiate on your behalf? I mean, it just gets- Or is it just self-managed? Right, I mean, it, it can be. Uh, it's man, it gets a, it gets really tricky, dirty, uh, real yeah, fast. Yeah, it's really yeah. tricky. I don't know the I don't know the answer. I think that's a that's way above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, from a local business standpoint, you know, if if they allow it and it happens, I mean, there would be a lot of opportunity for companies like us. I mean, how many times have we like sought out like influencers? Our influencers mm-hmm. are students, right? Like they get in there and they say, hey, like. Buy a scooter from New Scooters for less. Like if a student does so, that. So like I, I can be your name, image, and likeness for like the 50 year old market? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because yes. that's, like that's such a big market for you. Uh, um, you could maybe get some other coaches on on Vespas too. I've yeah, got a ton of Vespas I can, I can But I can't tell you how many times like, like we've looked up like people who have who have influence at, you know, at mm-hmm. the University of Florida and they're like, oh, they're an athlete. Stay, yeah. stay away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like can't can't touch them. Right. You know what I mean? And, be, and, I and mean, if that cheerleader cha- stands for um, anybody that's under the, the UAA umbrella that's considered an amateur. It's not even just uh, people in the athletic programs like a, a star quarterback or uh, forward for the soccer team or anything. It's it's literally I mean, band, band members are UAA mem- uh, employees. Some of them are, but yeah, I think, it's I think a, we it's can tricky, yeah, tricky yeah. subject. But cheerleaders, no, you can't you can't right. do anything with them. Um it's, it's gonna be super interesting to see how that unfolds. It, it's not like I said; it's not going away anytime soon, and I don't know what the right answer is. But it's gonna be interesting to see how all that happens. You know, uh, it's it's super captivating for sure. All right, so a couple last things before we wrap up. Um, you've been in Gainesville a very long time. What would you like to see happening in Gainesville? Like, what do you feel like Gainesville's missing? Ooh, good question. Hmm. I think we need a good small music venue. You know, like like the Ryman. Yeah. Something like that. We were actually just talking about that a we couple were. weeks ago, yeah. Um. And maybe a Dragonfly <laughs> too. <laughs> right. Yeah. Maybe one on like the northwest side of town where yeah. it's not so like centrally located that yeah. us, uh, us exactly. locals can enjoy. Do you guys remember That's Rolls a, and Bowls? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I was so I sad love that when place. Rolls and Bowls left. Yeah. That was the best. That was like Dragonfly too. <laughs> I mean, it really, I mean, it kind of was. It was yeah. like take out Dragonfly. Yeah. Uh, it's funny that you said the music video. We were literally, <laughs> literally talking about that just a couple weeks ago. Um, cool. And final, 
the final question, like where can where can our audience follow you, connect with you? You said you were on Instagram before yep. we started. Instagram, Twitter, all at at Becky Burley. Very original. Yes, which is the way I'm you on need. Facebook too, but I like hesitate to say that because I feel like old people are on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> That's well. sp- spoken like somebody that deals with eighteen to twenty two year olds a lot because I don't feel that way, but I'm also being told that old people and, and they're looking at me. Old people are the ones that like Facebook best. I like to remind people that <laughs> Facebook was for college students right. in two thousand four. That's right. You had to have a college address. Right. But I'm not a Snapchatter. I, I try no, it. I yeah. just you know wasn't your thing, huh? It's not my thing. So Instagram, yeah. Twitter, Twitter's number one though. You're like, yeah, Twitter and Instagram probably tied. tied? But if I okay. had to say Twitter, I use more just because I use Twitter from an educational perspective, not so much Instagram. Yeah. Hmm. Well, cool. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Yeah, I'm glad we finally did this. Yeah, thank you so much for. Uh, being... It won't be as long next time if I get it next time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for being an amazing customer. I apologize that your oh, place, that your turn signal is over there on Michael's desk, but we'll yeah. get it fixed. I'm 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 excited about Pearl getting her new blinking, <laughs> and uh, continue to uh, kick ass and develop young women into incredible human beings and empowering women everywhere. I'm uh, I'm just so proud to know you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, I'm proud to know you guys. You know, you guys did help start the scooter revolution. <laughs> did, <laughs> did help. We, we played, <laughs> played a very <laughs> small role. But I do think starting. it's cool that you're like more than scooters. That's pretty amazing. You know, uh, it's, it's really, it really stems from me like just falling in love with this community. You know, I, I came here from 2000, 2004 as, for, for college. I fell in love with UF, fell in love with Gainesville, started this business, been, been, doing, been here in Gainesville now for 20 years. And I just absolutely love this community. I wanna do anything that we can to, to build this community up. Our audience plays a huge role in that just by sharing this and supporting this podcast. And um, of course, having incredible guests come on and share their story like you uh, makes, it, makes it so awesome. So, <laughs> so thank you every, for everything that you're doing. He's super committed to and, getting uh, students to class on time. Yeah, super I, committed. I'm super committed super to committed. getting athletes to practice on time, so it all works out. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> I like both those. I like both those missions. Yeah. So thanks again. And podcast fam, listen, get notified when new episodes come out. I don't know if you guys know this, but you can text WHOA GNV to 484848 and then you will get a notification on Monday morning when the new episode is out. I send it out and it's like, hey, new episode's up and this is who's on the show. And uh, you can get that right to your uh, right to your phone, and of course, uh, definitely go subscribe. Whoagnv.tv is where you can subscribe and uh, send us a direct message. Say hello to Michael and I at Whoagnv on Instagram. Just send us a direct message, and we hope that you guys have an incredible week ahead. This is the Whoa GNV podcast, the podcast bringing you businesses and incredible soccer coaches with 500 plus wins that make you go, whoa. whoa. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Give us your best whoa. Whoa. We'll see you later. Bye. <laughs>